Yeah, I know that damn goose made him kind of loose, but there was no justification for an electronic goose. They made it seem like he was in a threatening position, but that was just another damn law enforcement fiction, because eyewitnesses made statements to the contrary. But what I witnessed too often from the constabulary is a lack of emotional fitness to be carrying weaponry and a dangerous disposition to be the adversary. And so he was tasted. You know, that electronic control device that's gotten out of control is now the vice for and out of control control free. That non-lethal weapon which has been surprisingly lethal for the more than 300 people whose lives this week. I already had a negative view about it. I never thought this close to home the news would hit. Check my phone. Five times my sister had called. Oh shit, something's wrong, y'all. Found out later. Two. Shot the ball, two. Stunned to cry. The guy who loved to run ball. The smile was still so childlike on a man child's body tall. Was shocked and stunned to death. Shrouded under hatred's pall. The first lady boy was my sister. How I wished I could be with her. How more than ever I missed her. I can only imagine her screams as her young mister wished the creator gifted her was ripped from her, creating a rift in her. God, please uplift in her the strength to go on. Took him to a game once. Thank God for that one time. Which he enjoyed and appreciated. Let me know I wasn't hated even though my calls and cards were related and though I rarely was around, he never be rated. Now, this is no excuse for it. It's, it's nothing that makes it right, but admittedly for a time, his mother and I were running tight. No, no, not like there was a fight. Nothing to range, just a brother and a sister is strange. But that was beginning to change. But for the longest time, it was for no other reason than that we hadn't sat down to talk. Now we were in the season of tragedy, which brought us into a closer wall. Now, respect to my sister, she always invited, always pleaded with me to come get her and be that uncle I was supposed to be. Spend time with her. Be a man with her. <coughs> Encourage and, if need be, reprimand her. Help him focus. Teach her. Give him some locus where he could reach in and center himself and execute his plans. Now he's been executed by trigger happy hands. Weird, isn't it? Spending a career working with other people's kids while your relationship with some of your own hits the skids made slippery with good intentions. So with all that having been mentioned, can't make the same mistakes of absence with the next two. Gotta honor Rell's memory and to them be true. Oh, internal investigations of course found the wrongdoing and thus no punitive action was ensued. Obviously they weren't really looking too much a part of the system to make the correct booking. The not so grand jury made no convictions. The oppressors hope that we lack conviction and will wither in this war of attrition. They act as if we owe them contrition. But no, no. There will be no acquiescence to the slaver's electronic whip. 
No letting the memory of Jarrell and others slip. No voltage that will leave our minds so dazed, our souls so dazed that we accept this shit as just an unfortunate phase and do nothing but turn the page or turn aside from our justified rage. No, we won't let ourselves be consumed by hate, but we don't appreciate the continued rate at which our killers get to escape. Too many folk have been charged and their murder is not charged. Too many folk have been charged while in the authorities charged and left twisted in some dying position while those in charge get to hide behind their badges and positions. So I charge us with the mission of unplugging the injustice which kills our brothers and sisters, which kills our children. Shocking, but true. So let's do what we gotta do. Speak love to our young ones while we have the opportunity. Speak <laughs> truth to power to end police impunity. We cannot and will not accept this current reoccurrence of hate. The survival of our families is an issue. Indeed, the survival of our community. Your rep. I miss you. Red Evans, what's up? something that we think is a little bit different on the poetry scene. Uh, a few years ago, good folk at Red Emma's, and you're going to learn more about what that is and who they are in a few minutes, invited me to bring some poetry into their space. This is a place that, for me in my life, I consider sacred space. I have lived here. This section right here, I know y'all didn't know this, but this is the Ken Brown office. Oh, yeah, that's my office. Okay. Because I'm always there. And a few years ago, they approached me to say, we need some poetry, but we needed to fit the ethos of what we do here at Red Ember. I'm honored that they approached me to do so. That's why we talk about peace, justice, and what? Poetry. There we go. We do a non-erotic type of mic here. It's not the Love Jones evening. There is nothing wrong with that. There are many poets in this room that tell you that I'm a damn fool at other venues and some of the salacious silliness that I will say. However, we're not going there tonight, so we ask that you not go there tonight. We do something that is going to talk about justice, real life, family, issues that we need to put in a poetic form so that we can do something about them. And so I'm so glad for you to be here. The other reason why I wanted you to give yourselves a hand is because this is the most people that have ever been to the Mother Earth Poetry Live. You will hear me go off mic and sometimes off mic because I like the mic. I like to play with the mic sometimes and sound like this as if it's a radio show. However, <laughs> it's a one piece open mic and this is wonderfully deep already. If you have not signed up on the list, and even for those of you that have signed up on the list, uh, those of you that are deeper in the list, I cannot in all honesty and integrity guarantee that we'll get you on this evening, but we're going to do our best. We're going to keep things rolling. Uh, so that we have plenty of open micers and that we get to our feature. You will hear more about our feature later on in the evening, but right now, if in case you did not know, it is the dynamic, and I'm so glad she is up here from so close in D.C., but sometimes these two cities seem so far away, so she's come to bridge that gap. Give it up for the first time, but certainly not the last time this evening, for Natalie E. Dillon. So this way, the word is this way, you know where the fruit is. This bookstore, as I mentioned earlier, behind me is the joint. This is the dope bookstore. So even afterwards, you should at least walk through for five minutes and see what eight <laughs> books you need yesterday, and which two or three you're going to have to take home and prevent yourself from buying seven more. Okay? Make sure that you check that out. Now, you hear me mention this as sacred space. And I want you to find out why. So the real question of the night before we continue is, what in the world is Red Devil's Bookstore Coffee House? And tell us, we have my dear friend and partner in the struggle, awesome educator and activist and educator in education, Iris Kirsch. Which I did. <laughs> 
clockwise. Don't do it And then now, slide it to where you need it to be, and then tighten it up clockwise, okay? So yes, I'm a school teacher. Um, and I'm also one of the worker owners of this beautiful project, Red Emma's. Red Emma's just had our 10th birthday. <laughs> Independent bookstores were lasting fewer than three years. Most were lasting a year. And everybody said we were crazy, that we couldn't do it. And then a year ago, we couldn't do it anymore because we'd gotten too big for our space. So we moved into this six times larger space. And we Um, for the poetry vibes, we really want to respect that people are sharing from and of themselves. <laughs> but there's like a little bit of movement in between people. So if in that little bit of movement between people, you want to come up and look through at the books, you won't be disturbing us if you're back there and you're actually off of this awesome camera that we have set up tonight if you're talking to Cullen at the books table. So feel free to do that. Um, uh, we have lots of different events. Poetry only happens seasonally. Um, we have events sometimes four or five times a week. And I wanted to tell you about a few things that are coming up. We did an event on Veterans Day um, with Larry Winters with his book Brother Keeper. And the turnout was really, really low. And our turnout for book events is usually really high. And I was really surprised. And Larry told me that nobody wants to deal with veterans' issues. And he has been writing and speaking about veterans' issues for years. And the turnout is always really low. So I wanted to particularly highlight <laughs> that we have another veterans' event coming up um, Sunday, November 23rd, with this book worth fighting for. Um, this is by a. Uh, Somebody who was in the middle. They come by loved ones. Somebody. Loved ones. Somebody. somebody. That's a lot better. That's a lot better. Don't let go Our flags are still burning with anger from the fire they set to our villages. When they beheaded our warriors, kidnapped our children, and raped our women. The sun from the smoke still coats the nostrils with the smell of deceit. They called the savages. So they robbed us of what it meant to be free. Tricked us into forgetting we grew wild like flowers and the sun fed only by the earth. So we could be held captive in marketplaces where they devalued our worth. They sold our flesh, blood, sweat, and tears and we have yet to get back what has been stolen for so many years. Who are you? I mean, really, who are you? Are you from Kenya or Timbuktu? Are you African or American? I think we've gotten confused. We've been scattered so much we can't even see our roots. Don't know what to believe, so we just follow through. They tell us who we are, and we believe them. Even when what they tell us is misleading, our storytellers have been silenced. Tongue ripped out and hung up as reminders for Christian now. Even though his praises were sung before his birth, we're holier than thou. Even though our creed devalues our worth, I wonder why chains, locks, and cages are so cruel now, when mentally we are still bound. We are controlled populists. Fed only the poison that has been given from the tree of knowledge to this glamorous life that we are living. We own nothing, not even ourselves. Yet we are foolish enough to still fear hell. Hell, hello, where are you now? This much bloodshed can't be swept underneath a towel. We've embodied the enemy's characteristics so much. It's an unstated, state of touch. We went from owning our land, our property, our homes, to now having one unpaid tax or water bill, and it's all gone. We are homeless and stranded without even enough courage to rebuild. Welcome to America's melting pot, where all parts of you resemble freedom is terrible. Thank you, Chris, for getting started. So if you were, weren't sure what exactly you want to hear at the vibe, that's a perfect way to start, all right? You want to hear a bunch of people dropping some knowledge, tapping into some real life, doing some dynamic things. I should mention that you see a video cam over there. We're trying something new this time. We want to try to take as much of it as we can before we run out of power because we want to promote this to future people and future
times. If you do not wish the video can to be run, um, get up, please let me know and we will cross it. But otherwise, uh, rest assured it's only for progressive and radical purposes. We will not um, sell you out or anything. <laughs> so, is that cool? Also, you may hear some people make what we call spoken word community church announcements. You may have an event, you may have an upcoming event that you want to announce, and you certainly are welcome to make a quick and brief announcement on those. You will hear something tonight. Next up to the mic, make some real Mother Earth noise for Joan D. Fall down. 
heavy with the load, but be at peace. Be at peace, because once it's all fallen down, life will still rise from the ashes. Green shoots poking up from the rubble, because life endures. If we nuked the planet until it glowed, killed every human being, still life would survive. Life endures in the cold in the vacuum, in the heat, in the deeps. Life endures. Life does not fall down. And others would come to replace us as we replaced the dinosaurs. Maybe, maybe the squirrels. Maybe the squirrels would evolve into hyper mammals with six-chambered hearts and armor-plated skin. And they would love. Because love endures. Love does not fall down. We make war on the planet. We make war on life. We make war on love. When it's a war, we can't win. So surrender now. So I say surrender now. Surrender to life. Surrender to love. And don't fall down. But rise up. Rise up. Rise up. We've already used the word intersectionality once or twice tonight. And that piece just exemplifies what we're talking about, bringing the issues together. Thank you so much for dropping that knowledge, Tom. I'm so excited to introduce the next poet because she's a very special person and poet to me. And she also has one of the coolest names on the poetry scene. So it would be so hard for me to give up some real Mother Earth noise for flotations. Make sure you spread the word. 
I know that you all tried to get two or three more of your crew here and they started hemming and hawing, giving excuses. Oh, I can't make it down tonight. I don't really do that poetry thing, this, that, and the other. So, hashtag, tweet it, post it, take a picture, take a quick video, take a quick scan of the rope so you can send that to him and say, look, for real though, when I tell you to come down to the vibe, I need you to come all down to the vibe, stop hemming and hawing, all right? Good. <laughs> I like the name of this next poem. Give it up for Urban Ninja. Decision to uh, uh, 
how folks see differently able people and all of these things are converging. So I'm so glad that somebody went there in terms of this whole idea of being seen as beast instead of human. That is, keep that in mind, because that's going to play out probably for the weekend is over. Thank you so much. One more time for Urban Nature. Mother Earth Poetry Vibe is when we tell the truth, which is why we're going to make some noise for this next poet who is named Rosebud Canton.
how you know why in the spoken world we talk about spitting that fire? Because that's what she just did again. That poem could not come too soon as far as what's going on this weekend in this country, in this world. Thank you, Rosebud Cannon. This next one is coming up. I'm so glad to see you. Uh, and we are uh, definitely honored by his poetic prowess. This brother is a force uh, on the poetry scene and forceful in his poetry, uh, holding it down both in Maryland and New Jersey. So uh, it's always good to see him because I know how he runs the road. Uh, and he is a person that uh, is the epitome of bringing all of the arts together, not only the poetry, he's a playwright, he's a novelist, uh, and he puts it down. Y'all give it up for our brother in poetry, Lamar Anthony Hill. I want to be respectful of time, but it is important that I say this. I have been all over the country doing poetry. 15 years doing poetry for a living. I have never been in a building where they said we not gonna make no loud drinks or make no noise. <laughs> Same night, running simultaneously on three different floors, all at the UB Blake Center. So you'll see three plays in one night. Basically, you'll watch a play, get up as an audience, go to another floor, watch another play. I am very proud of what we've done. I do not do uh, Chitlin Circuit type garbage. For those of you who don't know what the Chitlin Circuit is, you have phones in your pocket. You <laughs> So it's something I'm very proud of. The actors are ready, we're ready. It's gonna be a phenomenal night. I have tickets in my pocket tonight. I will give you a discount. I also have a CD with two hours worth of poetry on it, but if you buy tickets to the play, I will give you the CD for free because I want you to be at this performance. All right, so let's do some poetry, y'all ready? Yes. I came to say three words to you. Baltimore, those four people no more. <laughs> I came to say three words to you. And since we haven't spoken over 20 years, I figure it's past two. <laughs> See, for every bad thing I've ever done in my life, I always had the perfect excuse. My daddy was never there. I was never in his plans. So I acted like a boy, because no one ever talked to me in there. And all our relationships with women have been severely damaged because although I love my mother, I still subconsciously blamed her for your absence. Now it wasn't until after she died from cancer and I never got a call that I finally realized that I mean, this was her fault. It's the best she could with what she had. But can't no woman turn no boy into a man. Can't no woman make him understand where his pain comes from, why his heart is so numb, why he finds it so hard to trust, so hard to love. If daddy don't love you, it's hard to love somebody else. I'm saying if daddy don't love you, it's hard to love yourself. Mm. It's an endless line of stories just like mine. Angry men, scorned women, confused children, all innocent, all beautiful, all trying to get back to neutral, all putting themselves through hell to spare daddy's issues there. Has to be a reason when we make love, she calls me daddy, and I love her when she does. She is looking for a father's love. 
I'm looking to people how my father never was. Problem is, if she never got what we needed, we don't know what we want. We are both lost. Because if you show me a woman who never loved her dad, I will show you a woman who finds it hard to trust a man. And if you show me a man who never loved his father, I will show you a man who has kneeled at the altar of at least a hundred women with which he never should have bothered. The last time we talked, we argued. I told you to F off, you told me to get lost. I told you I've been lost since the day you took off. Don't you dare blame me for the pain that you gave me. It was your mother who told me you were a track star in school, but the day my mother told you she was pregnant was the fastest she ever saw your black ass. And the irony is, I look just like you. I got a bad temper and a quick wit just like you. They even tell me I write poems just like you. I wonder if you write pieces like this too. Pieces will never read because we are both in too many pieces to ever speak. But I made the <laughs> conscious decision to be whole. A whole man with a whole soul and a whole heart. Capable of receiving love in whole parts in real time. I decide to release you of your demons and simultaneously let go of mine. We are really together. I have taken 38 years for better than than never. I decide to let go of this pain forever. Pain that was eating me alive. Turn upon my insides. Why don't daddy love you? What difference does it make? We've all still got this life journey to navigate. Why wasn't daddy there? Why didn't you raise me properly? No longer will these questions stop me. I just pray that my God adopts me. Keeps me on my path. Forgives me on my past. Following this North New Jersey bastard as master. How to preach what I practice. So I walk out of eyes with a smile on my face. Because I finally realized I never needed the wizard in the first place. I was already smart. Already had a heart. I was already brave. So no matter what you say in a damn thing going to change, I came to say three words to you. I forgive you. Because my mother is an evangelist. And I'm convinced. I'm convinced that she won't be content until my voice is in a pulpit. I said my mother is an evangelist and you be hard pressed to find a more fervent servant. She is fire baptized and I watch men find God through her eyes. I said my mother is an evangelist. Every Sunday she leads souls to Christ. But I tell her, Ma, I'm a poet. Every night I lead souls into the light. I go where most preachers would not dare. Y'all mistaking these words for poems. These ain't poems. These are prayers. This is how I talk to God, and y'all just happen to be here. These are all my fears and Wrapped in the spotty clothes and packed in a tomb for three days. And the spirit moves the writer's block out of the way and resurrects the words you need to say. They ascend off the page where hundreds of people bear witness. So the generations from now will still be able to appreciate it. And from the grave, I said from the grave, I can still hear my mother begging for my soul. Hoping that one day I would see clearly and find my way back to the ministry and it's hard for her to understand because she's almost as stubborn as I am and I know here chasing a dream. I didn't choose poetry. Poetry chose me. I liberate souls every time I write a poem and I bring down the walls of Jericho every time I perform and I don't even come to me. I go where they live at. I mean even God is a poet. You need only read the 23rd Psalm and understand that. How ridiculous. Must I write a beat to say, yay, but walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, on my pen and my pad, they come yeah. That's why I get love no matter where I go in this country. I used to contemplate suicide at least three times a week before poetry, and I'll tell you that to just sympathy. I'll tell you that because I know at least three people in the audience are going through it with me. But who would have known? Who would have known that my own words could deliver me? Who would have known you could get closer to God with every metaphor and simile? And I ain't nobody. <laughs> just a ghetto bastard from an unforgiving northeast city. But with this pen, and with this pad, and with this mic, I'm larger than life. I fight the good fight. So when I'm dead and gone, bury my ashes in the same tomb where they buried Lazarus. Because a hundred years from now, some young poet is going to be thumbing through the CDs in his great grandmother's attic, and he going to raise me from the dead. I said, my mother is an evangelist. Every Sunday she leads souls to Christ. But I tell her slow and deliberate so that she will never forget that I'm a poet and I'm following the will of my God and I'm far closer to him at this very moment than I would ever be in a pulpit. Thank y'all for listening. For his friends, for the upcoming event, for his product, 
I need not even belabor what that dynamic experience was. One more time, Lamar Hill. I'm so happy to bring the next poet up also. I said that Lamar Hill is a force in the poetry scene. This next person is a very, very dear friend. Uh, and she is not only an intriguing poet, but she is a growing force on the poetry scene. And I had the privilege to be down with her venture, which she's going to tell you about, called Simply Poetic Entertainment. She has got all kinds of stuff going, so make sure that you connect with her. I'm just honored that I can be down with her. Uh, I'm on this staff. Um, my title is the official yesterday. You don't know what a yesterday is. <laughs> Can't do this, yes, Sherry. <laughs> Can I need you to do this, yes, Sherry? Y'all make some noise for simply Sherry. Tonight. If 